Welcome to African Women to Watch. I'm Ucheo Koronkwa. Now, Africa is a continent rich in natural resources, but despite having access to both fossil fuels and renewable resources, the World Bank says that at least 25 countries in sub-Saharan Africa are facing an energy crisis. Well, today, both governments and private businesses are looking to develop more reliable energy sources that would help power growth and development. Now, coming up on the show today, we speak to some of the key players. Amy Jadesimi, MD of the Lagos Deep Offshore Logistics Space, tells us how she plans to create a West Africa oil and gas industry hub. And we take a look at the importance of social, environmental and economic accountability in the petroleum sector with Rosalind Kainya, MD of Kina Advisory, and Jasandra Naika, CEO of Biotherm, and Futi Mahanyele, CEO of the Shanduka Group, speaks to us about investing in the development of clean energy on the continent. But first, Africa currently supplies about 12% of the world's oil and has vast proven natural gas reserves. But lack of infrastructure and a skilled workforce are the biggest obstacles to the future of growth in the industry. Africa has been referred to as the last oil and gas frontier. But after decades of natural resource flows out of the continent, its leaders believe it's time to speed up the development of local benefication. At the conclusion of the 21st African Union Summit, the organization's president, Lamini Zuma, stressed the need to focus on developing indigenous networks. We can't continue, as usual, to depend only on outside help. Outside help is, is welcome and will graciously accept it, but we must also look at how to mobilize resources ourselves uh, for development, for infrastructure, for all the things that will make Africa prosperous. However, the growth of local oil and gas production will depend on the quality of infrastructure and the efficiency of logistics. In order to leverage on the potential and reap the financial benefits, Africa needs high performance transport and logistics systems. In Africa in general, and when you look at Nigeria specifically, uh, there's some structure in place, um, some still trying to make sure that they can get to the right level of efficiency, and some already operating well. Uh, but if you try to relate it to some of the indigenous companies, because you know infrastructure requires substantial investment and quite critical to, to oil and gas activities, uh, uh, there is need to make sure that uh, you know those indigenous companies can participate effectively. I mean, in all of Africa right now, indigenous participation is now becomes the the order of the day. Mozambique has massive reserves of both coal and natural gas, but accessing these resources is a challenge. The country's ports and railway company CFM says. It needs about $25 billion to build the infrastructure that it needs to take the industry one step further. So how does Africa source the financing and find the capacity to operate new infrastructure? At a recent summit for African petroleum producers in Gabon, Equatorial Guinea's Minister of Hydrocarbons recommended that countries work together to develop supply chains and transport services. We do believe by doing those, helping those regional companies to work together and this is for example uh, service companies in Equatorial Guinea with Nigeria or with uh, Gabon, Cameroon we can able to do because at the end those individuals are nationals and if they make profits they will invest first in Africa before they will take it uh, out of our continent. African governments are also prioritizing local developments. Several countries are devising frameworks that tie their domestic industries to the growth that foreign investment brings. In Nigeria, the Oil and Gas Industry Content Development Act prioritizes local companies in government licensing agreements and compels international oil companies and service providers to go local. The Petroleum Industry Bill, which is yet to be passed, will also change the status quo in Nigeria's oil and gas industry. We did a very thorough job on the Petroleum Industry Bill. It was a work in progress, I always say, because when you have major bills that pull together 16 previously existing um, laws and regulations in the oil and gas sector, that is no mean feat, you know, at all. And so I think it will be a work in progress for quite some time, even when it has been promulgated into law. But when it is promulgated into law, it will 
to a very, very large extent, curb the issues of corruption. The Lagos Deep Offshore Logistics Company, or LADOL as it's better known, is the only Nigerian-owned offshore logistics base which has made a success of local content laws. Now, at the helm of this operation is Managing Director Amy Jadassimi, and she says her plan is to be at the forefront of positioning Nigeria as a hub for oil and gas in the region. One of the characteristics of the facility we've developed that has enabled us to provide the efficiencies that such a dynamic and expensive market needs is that we are fully integrated. We're a one-stop shop. So effectively, you're building a, a sort of a small um, industrial town where you will have logistics, you'll have fabrication, you'll have engineering, you'll have training schools, all of which enable projects which were previously done outside of Africa to be done inside of Africa for the first time in an economically viable manner. Amy started her career as a medical doctor, having attended Oxford University's medical school. But being a jack of many trades, Amy moved back to Nigeria after forays in medicine and investment banking to join her father's company, Ladol. Today, she is one of a few women at the forefront of Nigeria's oil and gas industry. There are so many different aspects of my job, particularly if you look at, you know, when we started, when I first joined my dad, there was really nothing on the ground. And we were, you know, raising a little bit of equity here and there and building up from nothing. To now, we have a fully operational base within a free zone. We were employing 150 people directly, 500 people indirectly. We have a hotel on the one hand. We have workshops on the other. So you're covering a very wide range of different services, a wide range of different facilities, and we're still going. But even as we get bigger and bigger, the challenges um, remain the same. Or even, or even increase as we're finding. And the range of activities that I have to do as the MD from you know, being on the ground, you know, teaching people um, how to you know, even write letters correctly. You know, those of us who work in Nigeria, you know everything. You, you know, people learn by seeing you do it. So, and I always say that's my management team as well. So we have a very interactive relationship, almost a flat structure. Ladol is now one of the largest privately financed projects of its type in the country. The company is developing some of the most strategically relevant infrastructure in the region. We started off in phase one of Ladol building a deep offshore logistics base. The reason we did that is because we saw that the market, the oil and gas market and the maritime market in West Africa was changing. And that change meant that there was going to be a higher demand for high value or highly specialized services to be delivered into not just um, companies working in Nigeria, but companies working in West Africa. Um, to, to cut a long and complicated short, um, story short, effectively the market has gone from one which is dominated by two countries, Nigeria and Angola, mainly um, um, uh, prospecting for oil onshore, to one that involves countries across the whole of Africa, East Coast, West Coast, and South Africa. It involves gas and oil finds that are often offshore in very deep waters. So that's a complete change in the, in the dynamic. After the break, oil companies operating in Africa are coming under pressure due to questionable activities. Rosalind Kainya talks to us about ensuring accountability. Welcome back to African Women to Watch. Now, investment in extractive industries remains the most important driver of foreign direct investment flows into Africa. Now, according to a United Nations report, FDI inflows rose 4% to $57 billion last year. However, several of Africa's resource-rich countries remain at the bottom of the international league table for human development. This lack of accountability within the energy sector is slowing down the continent's progress. Africa's energy sector has huge revenue-generating potential that could transform the lives of its inhabitants. In the oil sector alone, research indicates that government revenues could increase by $180 billion, or 15% of regional GDP annually. However, according to a 2013 report by the Africa Progress Panel, 
many African governments are failing to make good use of the wealth generated from natural resources. Africa's resource wealth can lift millions out of poverty. It can build shared prosperity and bring hope to future generations. It is eminently possible we can do it. But it will take bold leadership and it means building up proper governance, solidifying democracy, embracing transparency and accountability, and strengthening governance, institutions, and the rule of law. The report also shows that outflows of wealth currently exceeds the total amount of development assistance the continent receives every year. Africa, like the rest of the world, is suffering tremendous losses from the illicit and un unwarranted outflow of wealth through tax avoidance, the use of shell companies, tax havens, transfer pricings, and others that, in a way, lead them to avoid paying their fair share of taxes. Not only are some of the oil companies not paying their fair share of taxes, there has also been a lack of transparency on environmental issues. Oil spills have marred the landscape and the livelihoods of fisheries and farmers. Amnesty International published a report last year alleging that oil companies misrepresented the cause of environmental degradation. It also highlighted that the oil spill investigation system is essentially flawed. Well, the oil companies, including Shell and the Niger Delta, attribute most of the oil spills, and there are hundreds every year, they attribute most of them to sabotage of their pipelines or theft of oil. Um, what this report exposes is that more spills are caused by corrosion and equipment failure than the companies are letting on. Many African countries have the resources at their disposal to potentially reap a public revenue windfall. But governments need to be mindful not only of environmental concerns, but also of spreading the wealth generated from these activities to the broader population. If the continent can find this balance, then Africa's capacity for growth could become an actuality. Rosalind Kainia has built a strong reputation for herself globally as an advisor on socio-economic development in Africa's mining and oil industries. Now, as a lawyer, she's held senior positions with international companies such as Tullow Oil and De Beers. But she also advises governments on policy and legislative issues in the industry. I'm a great believer in business as the engine of development, but I also strongly believe in responsible business. And I think business, when it's being carried out, should be carried out, taking into account people and the environment that it can impact. I always found it very interesting that um, people would um, suggest to maybe a woman in the village not to cut down trees for firewood for her cooking, um, but not always. I mean, it, it's changed now, but not always give her an alternative and yet possibly go back to their homes and turn on their own electric hobs. So I was more sort of an advocate for, well, if you're um, going to um, instruct not to do, then suggest an alternative that the woman in the village could use. And what was it like working with these various governments, advising them, and what were some of the challenges that came with that? When I got into environmental law, it was still a, a quite a new and trendy area. This was in the early 90s. Um, and so uh, people were still interested, it was new, everybody was um, investigating and interrogating it. Um, I didn't have that much of a challenge, it, there wasn't so much of that knowledge out there. And so the ideas and suggestions that I brought were tended to be quite well received. I think for me the exciting bit was that very early on in my career I had the opportunity to work in South Africa advising um, the government there on uh, legislation and policies to do with the environment, um, the Water Act um, in the mid-90s, um, forestry policy and legislation and the Environmental Management Act and it was, a, it was an exciting time in South Africa then and um, continues to be so, but it was an exciting time for me to be part of that new um, era in South Africa. Do you think trends have changed when it comes to the socio-economic impact of natural resource companies doing business in Africa? There is a need for African um, citizens and African companies to also really spend time and invest in understanding the industry. 
um, and not necessarily just see it as um, because a company is in my country, I therefore have a right. I mean, one does. But I think it's being able to use that right um, as effectively and efficiently as one can. Mm. Now tell me more about your experience and your work towards improving the operations of natural resource companies in Africa. There's a very, very strong link, I find, um, in sort of thinking about broader um, national aspirations than just what your business wants at that particular moment. Um, and I found the same in, in, in Tullow. So we've done um, things like the set up the Tullow Group Scholarship Scheme because you sort of are talking to government and you realise that, well, one of the things that might be useful is building capability in country so people can participate in your business or in the industry as a whole or even that governments who are negotiating contracts with you can um, better understand um, the industry and actually have a, f a fairer negotiation between you and them. I think it's, it's counterintuitive, but people will think, why would a company want the government that they're negotiating with to better understand their industry? It makes for a more sustainable and longer lasting partnership um, when people know that what, the, what they've negotiated is fair. Today, Rosalind has gone on her own, establishing Kina Advisory last year to help local and international players navigate the political, economic and social risks of working in Africa. I'm a great believer in business as a very powerful engine for broader development. And um, I don't mean the sort of development that one sees by the use of aid, which has its place. I mean more sustainable, deeper, um, an inclusive development, the sort of development that empowers citizens to take their own destinies into their hands. So I'm hoping very much that Kina, by advising um, corporates, both international corporates that are operating or interested in Africa, or even local companies that want to um, become part of the extractive industries, um, supply chain, or even more so take um, a frontline um, part in the extractive industries, I'm, I'm hoping that Kina can advise them so that they can become part of this broader and uh, deeper and empowering development in Africa. After the break, we explore the future of renewable energy in Africa. Stay tuned. Energy is fast becoming a strategic sector in Southern Africa. The region is both a growing consumer and an emerging source of energy. Now, Shanduka Group, one of Southern Africa's largest investment holding companies, is looking to pursue opportunities in the renewable energy sector. And CEO Futi Mahanyele is driving this plan. Renewable energy will continue to, to grow. Um, you know, we need to see more renewable energy on, on the African continent. There's no doubt of that. Um, because certainly when we look at fossil fuels, whether you're looking at coal or whether you're looking at gas, um, you know, there they, they can only be a reliance to such a level. Um, obviously, countries like Nigeria, who have huge amounts of gas, will continue to have a, you know, a huge reliance on that, and it makes sense. Um, and for countries like us, which have, you know, significant resources in coal, will continue to have a, a reliance um, on coal. But I think notwithstanding that, we will see the emergence of renewable energy. But we shouldn't expect that we will see renewable energy having, you know, say, you know, you know significant um, role in, in our sources of, of energy. Um, but it will at least have, have a role to play in, in our energy sources. Futi joined Shanduka in 2004 as the managing director of Shanduka Energy. She was previously head of the Project Finance South Africa Business Unit at the Development Bank of Southern Africa. And prior to that, she was vice president at Fieldstone, an international firm specializing in the financing of infrastructure assets. When I was working for Fieldstone in New York, um, most of the projects that I was working on were actually energy projects. Um, and so I got a lot of experience in working with them. And I was with Fieldstone for about seven years. Um, and so when I, was, when I then moved to the DBSA, um, where I headed up project finance, um, we were working on a number of electricity projects uh, again. But, you know, obviously it was a broad spectrum of infrastructure projects. Um, and, and so in a way it kind of followed me, I guess, because when I came to Shanduka, 
um, I was asked to set up an energy division, you know. So, I don't know, somehow energy has just kind of followed me. <laughs> Biotherm Energy has successfully constructed and commissioned renewable energy projects worth about 52.5 megawatts and it's actively expanding its activities across the continent. Well, driving this project is CEO Jasandra Naika, who believes that this company can become the leading developer of renewable energy projects on the continent. We are absolutely fortunate in the terms of the resources we have when it comes to our solar resource, our wind and hydro. We have some of the best resources in the world. And what renewables allows us to do is actually capture those resources and convert it into electricity. So in terms of natural resource, Africa is abundant uh, in order to produce electricity. I guess the, the bigger challenge is how does one go from harnessing that resource and actually creating power at the very end. Key is regulation. Uh, and getting governments to understand that using solar uh, power or wind power for that matter is actually a very, uh, can provide a modular approach to, to pr producing power in, in much needed environments. Jasandra Naika has about seven years of international investment experience in the renewable energy sector. But she started her career working for major financial companies like Great Private Equity, Lehman Brothers and PCG Asset Management. I came from a financial services private equity background and there was an um, assignment whereby um, a, a Middle Eastern state owned enterprise was looking for someone with my skill set to advise on an investment strategy in the alternative energy sector. Um, while I had the experience from an investment strategy development perspective, uh, I knew very little about uh, alternative energy but I was obviously working in a team where many of them had very deep energy ex expertise. Um, this particular state-owned enterprise was um, quite keen to understand what it could do in the alternative energy space given its heavy reliance on oil. Um, and uh, basically that, that was the assignment that catalyzed this entire passion and desire to actually focus on renewable energy. Biotherm was awarded four solar power purchase agreements in 2013 under the Zambia Solar Program. And this year, the company has been shortlisted in the Ugandan Get Fit Solar Facility. As the energy landscape shifts from fossil fuels to renewable energy, Biotherm plans to partner with local players on the continent to take advantage of this transformation. I grew up, my generation has grown up in an environment where fossil fuels is, is completely dominant. And the next generation will probably grow up in an environment where it will be less dominant. I'm not saying that it will be completely eradicated, but it will be definitely less dominant. And it's all about sustainability. I mean, we're living in, an, in, a, in a world with uh, an expanding population, and we need to look at ways in which we can provide so solutions uh, for, uh, for necessities like electricity and how we can actually access electricity in a shorter and quicker time frame. Renewables does that. Industry experts believe that Africa has to ensure that the solutions to its energy crisis take on board the long-term viability of renewable energy sources. Now, it's also imperative that the production of these energy sources fuel not only the end user of the energy source, but also the communities in which it's produced. Thanks so much for joining us on this edition of African Women to Watch. If you want to watch this episode again, you can catch us at www.bloombergtvafrica.com. Till next time, goodbye.